with this cosmic coincidence, and it does appear to be a, co- a coincidence. But but is this enough? Do you think to carry the issue, give the issue some more weight? Well, certainly give it weight in Chelly Vince. Um, in terms of uh, in the rest of the world, I think uh, you know, Andy, we have a pretty short uh, uh, time span for, for breaking news. So I would think for a couple of days, you know, it's in the front of everybody's mind. Uh, but then I think it's only people with a longer term perspective who uh, will remember it for a while. And hopefully, we're going to be able to convert that into both public information in terms of education of the public on what these things are all about, but also convert it into support uh, because, as you know, the Sentinel space telescope that we are proposing and working on is a privately funded space venture. I mean, we're a non-profit. This is not for profit. Uh, We're a non-profit foundation, but uh, we're not looking at government money. We're really looking at uh, support from the general public, the world public, really. We're going to have to put this into an orbit around the sun at about the distance of Venus. So that's a deep space mission. Yeah. And uh, to, to build, manufacture, launch that, and operate that spacecraft for six and a half years it's going to cost us about $450 million. The question has arisen periodically on the Internet, of can we be smarter than the dinosaurs? <laughs> now, here we'll we have... We'll see. Huh? <laughs> we'll see, Andy. <laughs> I guess so. So we have, in other words, we uh, clearly have the foresight to recognize that this is possible, but now can we actually be smarter in the sense of, Intelligence is taking knowledge and doing something with it. We're not only smarter, clearly, than the dinosaurs, but we have machines that they didn't have. So we clearly have both the knowledge and the capability to protect the Earth from these impacts. The bigger question is, do we really, will we really recognize our common, our shared interest in survival to the point where we can cooperate internationally to make decisions and protect life on Earth. It's a big question. And, uh, you know, we're broken into nations and tribes of all kinds and sizes. And uh, whether we can recognize our common humanity to the point where we do better than the dinosaurs, I think is a, it's not a clear answer to that big question. I, I think... I- if I remember correctly, you related a kind of a sad story when you got back, which was that these uh, lawmakers' aides kind of came up to you. They were very appreciative. They thought it was great testimony. But then they kind of privately said, you know, there's just no way we're going to be able to get this money for these systems because uh, the political opposition would, would always be there, you know, and it being a boondoggle. I don't know if that's accurate, but it kind of, kind of that was my impression. Yeah, there, well, there's always the problem when you're dealing with something that's, especially with something that's unusual, and even worse, something that is, in fact, not officially on anybody's um, to-do list in terms of legal requirements. I mean, NASA NASA does have a legal requirement to discover asteroids and to to do certain research work, uh, track them, uh, catalog them, etc., But NASA does not have the responsibility, nor does anyone else, for protecting the Earth from uh, potential impact. And so um, it's always been sort of a second, um, uh, it's not even a second priority. It's a pretty low priority in NASA's normal work, which is to, you know, do space science and to explore space. But public safety, I mean, this is really public safety. This is not science or exploration. And so it's always been a sad sister, and it was only because the Congress really pushed back in the mid to late 90s that NASA had year after year about $4 million, all of $4 million um, annually to do the search program. Um, But then uh, more recently, with some other recommendations that Tom Jones and I and others made, NASA's gotten bumped up to $20 million, 
But now with the sequester and everything and the tremendous um, contention in Washington uh, and really cutting into the bone almost on all federal agencies, um, you know, this just isn't, I, I wouldn't think that this is going to go anywhere. Obviously, there certainly should be some attention paid by the space committees in both the Senate and the House, and uh, I have no doubt that they will. Um, it, it's an interesting question, given the financial situation in the federal government, not not to mention the tremendous bipartisan or, or you know partisan contention going on and the sequestration and everything else. I mean, this is a tough time for anybody to propose spending money that isn't already committed. In fact, everybody's talking about cutting everything, not spending more. So, you know, it's, it's one of the nice things about being a private entity. We can focus on something that's of very great importance and we can see it through, notwithstanding, you know, the rapidly changing political environment. Who should take responsibility for protecting the planet from an inevitable um, calamity like this? And do you see there's been much movement on that? Well, um, yes, uh, to some extent. In fact, the, uh, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space has just concluded, uh, I mean, as of Friday, actually, uh, concluded its uh, annual scientific and technical subcommittee meeting in Vienna, and one of the prime issues that's being discussed right now is the near-Earth object decision process, the decision-making process. How does the international community come together to make a collaborative decision on something like this? And we've been working that through the United Nations since 2005. Actually, when I say we in that particular case, it's not the 612 Foundation, but rather the Association of Space Explorers. Um, but uh, that has been working through since 2005 and 2006. And this year, in fact, um, the Mexican delegate, uh, Sergio Camacho Lara, um, who's been heading the action team on near-Earth objects, is running our recommendations, collective recommendations that we've worked on uh, for five years now through First, the technical subcommittee, and then in uh, June of this year, through the full Committee on Outer Space, and then in the fall, it will go to the United Nations General Assembly. And so that will form the first structural uh, skeleton, I would say, because there's no meat on it, but it will be a skeleton within the United Nations structure for decision-making when a threat arises. You know, the three fundamental elements uh, to the issue of protecting the Earth from these things is, number one, is to um, have early warning, adequate early warning. And that's what our Project Sentinel, our, you know, our IR telescope, is all about. Um, a second one is uh, once you know something's coming at you, then you have to have a way to you know prevent it, and that's deflection. And right now... While we know how to deflect, and B612 Foundation was a major part in developing those capabilities, nevertheless, it's never been demonstrated, and it's, it's not my view that it would be the best way to have a, a private initiative to deflect asteroids. That really ought to be, that in fact, public safety is a fundamental responsibility of government everywhere. Sure. And so, to me, NASA needs to be given the clear responsibility to deflect or to protect the Earth from uh, from, a, from an asteroid uh, uh, predicted impact. And then the third and most challenging uh, issue is the one which uh, you joined us for in Mexico City, and that is the international coordination. Um, that's a little bit harder for people to understand conceptually, but the easiest way to state it is that when you deflect, you can't deflect an asteroid without putting temporarily at risk 
other nations and people who were not initially threatened yeah. in the process of deflecting it and eliminating it as a risk for everybody. So that that international complexity says that there has to be some coordination at the international level. And ultimately, I think we we may watch ourselves get hit with the first one that uh, you know threatens hopefully in the ocean uh, while everybody is still debating at the UN. But hopefully that will only happen once. <laughs> and then we'll be in a position to make a decision in a timely way. Well, uh, I, I hope so. It'll, it'll, it'll be fast enough um, in the long run, let me, let me put it that way, because these things only hit, the big ones only hit um, once every 300 or more years uh, on average. Uh, you know, the one that came in uh, in Chelyabinsk uh, the other day, uh, they finally sized it at about 51 meters in diameter, and... Um, Oh, excuse me. That was 17. Pardon me, 17 meters in diameter. But even that is only about a once in a hundred year event. Amazing. Uh, so, if we can get uh, you know, our B612 Sentinel telescope, IR telescope, uh, into orbit as we plan in 2018, uh, by the time we get to 2020, 2021, 2022, we'll have something like uh, you know. Uh, 50% of the Tunguska-like objects, that is, things like DA-14 that went by the other day, the same day as the, the Chelyabinsk thing. Um, so, you know, that 50, having 50% is a lot better than what we have now, which is less than one-half of 1% 1 of objects that size. So, you know, these are not panic situations, uh, but... You know, they can hit any day, as we found out last Friday in Chelyabinsk.